David Dulio, Professor of Political Science and the Director of the Center for Civic Engagement at Oakland University. Always great having you on the show. Boy, we had you on just like a week or two ago and so many things to talk about. I remember uh, one of the things we said, it was like, it's exciting. That's going to be an exciting month. It is like every single day something new is happening. We'll start off with the president. What part, Ron? I know. Where do you want to go from there, right? Yeah, because uh, we had you on right before the debate. So let's just go ahead and, and start there. If the president recovers enough for there to be a second debate, do you think we'll see a repeat of the first one? That's a good question. I think that there have been discussions, in, even starting immediately after the first one, about format changes. And uh, you, you've, you've read the same stories that I have about maybe potentially uh, having the, the moderator have a mute button on microphones. Uh, boy, based on the, on the first on the first debate, that probably seems like a good idea. I've even seen folks uh, suggest putting both candidates in a soundproof booth <laughs> and only turning on the mic when uh, it's their two minutes. Um, of course, the candidates would have to agree to those changes, and uh, that's not a guarantee. Uh, we, we may see some uh, extra precautions uh, instituted, maybe because of the president's uh, positive test. Uh, maybe a, a plexiglass barrier. There's going to be one of those, I understand, uh, between uh, Vice President Pence and Senator Harris uh, in the vice presidential debate tomorrow. Uh, who knows? Maybe we even have the second debate virtually. Uh, so I think there's just a, there's a lot up in the air. I think it happens, but I think the the process or the logistics of it remain to be seen. Do you think Trump intended to go in there and be as disruptive as he was? I think it's it was certainly part of the strategy to frustrate the former vice president. Uh, you know, whether or not that went too far. I've even heard some Republicans complain that, uh, boy, the president should not have interrupted Biden so much because if the idea is to get Biden to uh, make a mistake, you got to give him some time to make the mistake and, and not interrupt him and cut him off. So we'll see if there's a slight change in strategy uh, in a week or so. It was definitely more like a reality show episode than a presidential debate that we are used to. I even saw on social media they had bingo cards made out, like drinking bingo cards. Where it was oh, like, sure. oh. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, really, it, it, it was a show, right? Th those are nothing new to politics, right? There are, there are. Uh, I can't believe I'm going to say this on, on television but uh, in the radio, but there, there are drinking games for the State of the Union address, drinking games for debates. Uh, it, it's, it, it, it's commonplace. Where have I been all these years? It would have been so much more entertaining, I think. Uh, so now we let's talk a little bit about the upcoming election. How do you think the election is going to be impacted with the positive COVID-19 case for the president and so many members of his team and other Republicans? Sure. I, I think you, you've seen uh, one impact already is that the, the president is not able to campaign the way that he would like. Uh, with uh, even in, in the era of, of COVID-19 and the restrictions that are in place, um, you know, he's been able to have rallies, including here in Michigan and in, in places like Freeland, uh, in airport hangars, uh, which have come under some criticism, but he's been able to do them with thousands of people. Uh, and which and, and that's even different than, than he would like. He's used to filling arenas with 15, 20, 30,000 people. He can't do those. Uh, and he won't even be able to do the, the public events uh, for the next uh, at least 10 days or so. So, and the campaign's already announced that, right? They've said that we're, they're gonna move all of their events that were planned to uh, virtual events. Uh, the vice president even uh, stood in for, uh, for the president a couple days ago, I think maybe over the weekend at, um, at an event. And I think that'll continue. Uh, I, I think that we need to see a, a little bit more time elapsed before we, we can say with any certainty how the state of the race has changed, uh, if at all. And I think that it'll be even it'll be difficult to separate the effects of, say, you know, if there is a shift, was it the debate? Was it the president's 
positive test, uh, hard to, to isolate one of those effects. David Dulio with us, the professor of, a professor of political science at Oakland University and the director of the Center for Civic Engagement, joining us today on the Oakland County Megacast. Um, on to the vice presidential debate tomorrow evening between Vice President Mike Pence and Senator Kamala Harris, the Democratic challenger for that position. What can we expect to be different from this debate as opposed to the presidential debate? You expect it to be more tame and more substantial than what we saw last week from the president and former Vice President Joe Biden. Well, I think it'll be more tame for sure. I think the, the substance part is uh, is up in the air. And, and that's not a, a knock at either Vice President Pence or Senator Harris. It's it's really a knock at the format, right, where um, th these individuals are asked to talk about incredibly complex issues and problems and solutions to those problems in, in a relatively short amount of time. Uh, you know, and, and I've, I've talked to my students before the presidential debate uh, about this, and, and, you know, we talked about how can you really talk about health care in two minutes? Can you talk about immigration in two minutes? Uh, can you talk about trade in two minutes? It's really hard. So we're, we're almost uh, we're almost set up for failure when it comes to uh, the format really driving us toward uh, basically soundbite politics. Uh, you know, I do think it'll, as I said, I think it'll be tamer, um, if only because uh, Vice President Pence has a, a very different demeanor when he's on a debate stage than President Trump does. And, and your, uh, your viewers and listeners have, have seen that before. Uh, Pence is calm. He is um, uh, very meticulous. And I think that'll come out again. You have your pulse on the younger generation because you are a professor and you get to engage with the students. What feedback are you getting from your students when it comes to politics and what we're seeing right now? Are they more engaged or less engaged? And on top of that, are they even relying on mainstream media to get their information? Uh, let's take the, the second question first and come back to the other one. Uh, no, they're not, right? They, they live through social media. They live through sound bites, even more so than, than, two, the, than the two minute debate answers that, that we're gonna see tomorrow night. Um, you know, we talked about this after the debate on uh, when we were in class on Thursday and, and I was shocked to hear them say that they weren't really all that enthralled with Joe Biden. Uh, in a lot of the young people these days, as you know, and it, and it, it, it uh, was on display yesterday when Bernie Sanders was in Ann Arbor uh, talking to college kids. A, lo a lot of the uh, uh, younger generation, uh, the, the newest voters, are uh, they tend to be progressive. They tend to lean further to the left. And th they're not terribly enthralled with Biden and, and may not vote for him. Wow, that's so interesting to to hear. Uh, let's uh, shift a little bit and talk a bit more on state politics. The Supreme Court ruling on Governor Whitmer's executive orders. How do you think that's going to impact the upcoming election? Well, it's just another it's just another uh, uh, point to fight about, right? It's another uh, another element that's going to drive a wedge between between partisans. The judicial reform or for the judges in their reelection or election campaigns, I think before mm -hmm. we we don't pay attention to that. So many of us don't pay attention. Very few people do. But now this issue of could this go back before the Supreme Court and with a more liberal judge and have it reversed? Do you think that could maybe get people to start paying attention because the ads are on the air already? Sure. And, and, and I think, too, that there are. So, well, let me put it this way, right? It, most people come out and vote for the offices, as, as we would call it, at the top of the ticket. Uh, presidency, uh, U.S. Senate, uh, U.S. House, and then you get down further, the, further down the ballot into state legislature and then your, your local races. And, and the, um, the judicial elections are always much further down. And, and there's always what we would call ballot fall off. Uh, where people stop voting the further down the ballot they go. So the, the voter turnout or the, the number of votes cast for the president is going to be very, very much higher than uh, for the Supreme Court. I think, though, that the, the folks that are uh, 
going to vote for that office are, are heavily partisan, right? They know who their nominees are. And that's worth mentioning is that the, the Supreme Court and all the judicial elect, the Supreme Court nominate, Supreme Court elections in Michigan are um, nonpartisan on the ballot. But those candidates only get on the ballot because a party has nominated them. So we've got two candidates that are that have been nominated by the Democrats and two two candidates that have been nominated by the Republicans and the partisans know who they are the folks who are uh, hardcore Democrats or, or, or died in the wool Republicans they know who their nominees are and they're going to vote for them David Dolio with us professor of political science and the director of the Center for Civic Engagement at Oakland University today with us on the Oakland County megacast um, David with Governor Whitmer's orders being revoked by the state Supreme Court, it, it kind of leaves a little bit of the response of COVID-19 in flux, which opens an opportunity for the state legislature to start making some decisions together, which could benefit either party or, or, or one party singularly. Do you believe that the governor's orders being revoked and the need for a state response will encourage the legislature to be a little more productive on this particular issue, particularly because there's a chance that unemployment benefits and other safety pr precautions may be in jeopardy as the governor's orders are revoked. Sure, well, I would say two things. First, uh, we've seen in the last day or so the Michigan Department of Health issue its own orders that, that are in some cases taking the place of the governor's orders, which it can do. Uh, through statute. In terms of the legislative response, you know, I, I think it's the, the legislature, uh, both the Republican-led House and Republican-led Senate have been clamoring for this, right? They have been asking the governor to uh, involve them in the, in the COVID response, and, and they have been met with a, uh, with a firm no. So now that they're going to have that chance, now's their time. And, and it's, it's put up or shut up, right? They're going to have to work together to do things that are beneficial to the state, whether it's on uh, uh, health and safety measures, whether it's on uh, unemployment benefits, it, it's, they're, they're going to have to work together. And this is, this is shared powers. Um, you know, you, you've probably heard the term separation of powers. Uh, that, that's the system that we have. And that's not really true, right? Power is not truly separated between, uh, the, say, the executive branch and the legislative branch and the judicial branch. They each have a role in all different all different powers of government. The legislative process, the legislative power, I should say, is shared between the the legislative branch, the executive branch, and even the judicial branch. So this is going to be shared powers on display. Uh, the legislature and the governor having to work together. So many of these very important topics are changing daily, but yet mm. we already have an election underway. While we typically like to think November 3rd is election day, people here in the state of Michigan are already voting. But with so many changes, do you think that's going to impact how they vote like maybe they voted absentee but then they want to spoil their ballot and go in and vote in person because the people and the issues are changing how is this going to impact our outcome of our election because we are voting early now it's an interesting question and and i think that you know in this election cycle in in this political environment the the number of people who would want to do that is is really really small i think most people have their minds made up uh, whether or not they're going to vote absentee, whether or not they're going to vote in person. Um, they know who they're voting for, and they're probably not changing their mind. Yeah. How big of a deal is undecided voters at this point? I think this has been such a polarizing election that there's got to be very few undecided voters still out there. And that's usually at this point in time of an election campaign who they're trying to go after. Right. And, and I think that I think you're right about that. The, the number of, of persuadable voters, the number of people who are still making up their mind is uh, is really small. And frankly, there may be more people who are deciding whether or not they're going to vote at all uh, versus making up their mind between are they going to vote for Biden, Trump or somebody else. And, and that's really a, a key factor in, in moving forward, right? And 
the campaigns at the top of the ticket are, are going to be engaged from now until November 3rd in uh, communicating with their voters uh, in as personal a way as possible and making sure that they turn out their voters, whether it's through absentee or through a, a, a vote in person at the polls. Uh, that that number is is small, but it's still important. I think that in, in a divided election, the divided society, which we have, polarized polarized nation, we're, uh, we're in a turnout election, right? Whichever side gets their supporters to the polls the best probably wins. Now that may change between now and November 3rd if the race sees a big shakeup either coming out of the coming out of the deb first debate after the president's uh, positive test after the the upcoming uh, vice presidential debate there's a lot still left to happen so the race could certainly sh shift and we're seeing uh maybe some signs of that there's a, a new poll out this morning uh in the detroit news and and on uh, channel four uh about biden extending his lead uh, though it's single singular polls are always dicey to look at right so we, we'd want to see more polls to know if there's if, is this actually a um, a real result are we seeing a real shift or is it a uh, or is it a, a an outlier so to speak david dulio with us here on the oakland county mega cast because you you do have access to the students i've talk to some of the younger generation people in their 20s and i've been surprised at how many have said they don't plan on voting because they're sick of it they're sick of the divisiveness they're just turned away from the whole process and they're such an important part of this election are you hearing those same concerns with some of the students or people that they know as well sure i, I had a student in class tell me that that uh, half a dozen of his friends uh, after the first presidential debate uh, said that they changed their minds and they're going to vote third party because they just couldn't stand what they saw. And, and that really gets at, I'm glad you brought that up because that gets at something I said before about, you know, the decision now may be for some, not between candidates, but between do I cast a ballot or not? And, and if they don't, it, it's probably a protest, right? Because they, they don't like what they see. They don't like um, bickering. They don't like the constant name calling. They don't like the back and forth. They don't like all the disagreement. And what did we have in the first presidential debate? All of that and more, right? It was, it was a debacle. And, and I think everybody, any true, um, you know, sort of non-biased observer can say that and, and look at that and see, and see it, right? And those are the things that absolutely just drive a, a lot of Americans crazy. And, Many of them we would put in that persuadable, undecided category uh, because maybe they're just now starting to pay attention. They're not like you and me that that pay attention to this from from day one of the of the presidential race, which was frankly back in 2016. <laughs> the you know the 2020 campaign started in 2016 or early 2017, but a lot of Americans don't really enter the the thought process until uh, Labor Day or so of the election year. Wow, that's amazing to think about. David Dulio, Professor of Political Science and Director of the Center for Civic Engagement over at Oakland University. You all have great things going on over at the Center for Civic Engagement. I know we've talked about it before, but do you want to give a quick plug for some of your upcoming virtual events? Sure. Just in the next week, we've got two great programs that, are, uh, that, that we're going to offer uh, both the campus and the community. Uh, the first one is tonight, actually, at 5 o'clock, uh, virtual session with two folks that your viewers and listeners uh, probably know very well, Nolan Finley from the Detroit News and Stephen Henderson from Detroit Public Television and Detroit Radio. Uh, they're going to talk about civility. They're going to talk about their, they, they run something in addition to their day jobs, the, uh, the civility project. And even though Nolan and Stephen disagree uh, on almost everything politically, they remain great friends, right? And, and, and what they're gonna do is talk about their relationship. They're gonna talk about how they maintain that friendship while disagreeing, uh, maintaining civility. Uh, folks that attend are uh, gonna have a chance to, to be in some breakout rooms and talk with other individuals who are interested in this. Uh, and then on Monday, we're going to do a program with a, a gentleman named Stan Greenberg, uh, 
all focused on Macomb County politics. This is it, Macomb County is a really interesting place politically. It is home of the uh, Reagan Democrats back from the 1980 and 1984 elections, which helped Ronald Reagan carry our state. Uh, Stan Greenberg is the pollster who I who coined that term, and he's going to come uh, virtually and and talk to us about Macomb County politics, the history of it, and the and the and what's happening in terms of current dynamics. Uh, folks can see all of the stuff that we do at the center through our Facebook page. We are at O-U-C-C-E, and you can uh, get links to sign up for both of those and as well as things that are coming up in the future uh, right there. Thanks for the opportunity. I'll be fascinated to hear what he has to say about Macomb County politics because Mark Hackle is stepping out basically going against the Democratic Party. And I'd be fascinated to see his intake or hear his intake on that, his insight. Uh, you know, he was really the one who blew the whistle on the prosecutor, Eric Smith. They've been longtime friends. He's been basically, you know, speaking out against the governor and the mask mandate, yeah. said, that he, that, you know, Macomb he, County's not going to issue one. It, it's a it's a very interesting place politically. The, the Reagan Democrats, as you know, are... Uh, are folks who, at least in the 80s, considered themselves Democrats, but they voted for Reagan. They voted for Reagan because they thought he was tough. They thought they stood. They thought that he stood up for the little guy, and that he always had American interests in mind, uh, at home and abroad. And we saw that carry over in 2016. I, 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 I would argue that the Reagan Democrats were back with a vengeance in 2016 and helped Donald Trump carry Michigan because they said the same things about him. And if we look at, at 2020, look, look at how Joe Biden is campaigning in Macomb County. He's talking about uh, build it in Michigan, build it in America, right? That's, that's trying to tap into some of those same sentiments. So real quickly, if, if people cannot uh, actually watch it during the event, are you guys going to record these sessions that they could check yeah. it out for later? Yeah. Absolutely, they can they can find us on on that Facebook link. Uh, folks are always uh, welcome to email me if they have questions, uh, and it's uh, d dulio so d d u l i o at oakland.edu. They can they can reach me that way. Thank you so much for your time. You're like one of my favorite guests. You're always engaging and enlightening and informative at the same time. So thank you for your time you and good much. luck with the event tonight. I'm sure it's going to be a Appreciate great event. It.